Hello and welcome to Pax Britannica. You are hearing Sam covering the beginnings of Empire and pretty soon he's going to leap into the Honourable East India Company. He's kindly let me say a few words though about my show, the Age of Victoria podcast. When most people think of the British Empire, they think about the Victorians. But there's so much more to the Victorians than just an empire. I cover the world in the age of Victoria. The people and events that shaped the modern world. Rich or poor, famous or forgotten. My show is about the people. Those who built the railways, steamships, telegraphs and so much more. Or wrote great literature and poems. Or explored and died in the mines, or in famines, or fought on all sides in the many, many wars. It is about the people and the journey that shows how the world was changed beyond all recognition. I've covered triumph and horror, ghost stories, war, volcanoes, politics, education, royalty, disasters, poverty, and so much more including Dickens, Master Criminals, Scandals, or the history of gin and fish and chips. I hope you'll join me on the journey. But for now, take it away, Sam. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 20. The East India Company. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we saw the fallout of Prince Henry's early death and how the king handled the second session of his English parliament. In case you missed it, he handled it badly. We also saw how James chose immediate financial benefit over a continued English presence on the continent through the Dutch cautionary towns. This week, we will return to England's actions beyond the seas, the colonies in the New World, and look at the first decades of the imperial behemoth that was the East India Company. Before we continue, I'll just briefly warn everyone that this episode will be dealing with slavery, and will have quotes from contemporary sources that use language that's not particularly pleasant. Now, it's been a few episodes since we left the shores of the British Isles. Hopefully it's clear why. There were important domestic developments that would have an impact on the Stuart Court's interactions with the rest of the world. The plantation in Ireland was chugging along, with each ethnic group quite happily ignoring James's desires for them to come together in peace and harmony. In America, Virginia was now a permanent settlement, the value of tobacco attracting planters despite the dangers of the voyage and destination. But by the time Prince Charles was invested as Prince of Wales in November 1616, the English had expanded their colonial and trade horizons substantially. First, let's look at the tiny Atlantic archipelago of Bermuda. We last saw Bermuda in episode 11, when it was the unexpected refuge of a ship full of colonists bound for Jamestown. They had been shipwrecked, but would eventually complete their journey to the North American continent. But the islands were still formally claimed for the English crown, and named after the admiral who had landed slash crashed there, Sir George Summers. In 1612, the Virginia Company organised the settlement of the Summers Isles with the intention that the new colony mirror its larger western neighbour in the cultivation of tobacco. In contrast to Virginia, Bermuda was a veritable paradise. It enjoyed a mild climate and fresh water, and an abundance of birds, wild pigs, tortoises, and large shoals of fish. Since these animals had no real experience of humans, they were fairly unafraid 
and so made them easy to hunt. That was the other advantage for the English settlers. The archipelago was uninhabited by any indigenous peoples, in contrast to Virginia, which was at this time fighting the first Anglo-Powhatan War. In 1615, Bermuda was removed from the responsibility and remit of the Virginia Company and granted to the newly founded Summers Isles Company. By this point, the difficulties of the early years were behind them. When the population reached about 500 people, there were concerns that the harvest would not feed everyone, and so around 160 were dispatched from the primary settlement to another of the islands that made up the archipelago. When these settlers arrived in Cooper's Island, it took six weeks for the first deaths to occur. How did they die? Starvation? Disease? Violence? According to Professor Virginia Bernhard, it was from overeating. It wasn't all sunshine and roses, however. Tobacco plantation was, much like in Virginia, the primary employment of the colonists. But Governor Daniel Tucker wished to diversify into producing other goods. He seems to have been particularly enamoured with finding and selling pearls, and made arrangements for pearl divers to be brought to the island. There are two reasons this spells the end of the sunshine and or roses. The first, there were no pearls. The second, was that this is the introduction of slavery to our narrative. Englishmen had been involved in the slave trade before this point, most notably in the 1560s with Captain Hawkins, interloping into the Spanish and Portuguese trade networks. But this is the first time that English settlements in the New World imported enslaved people. Before we go any further, I feel I should make something clear. Yes, indentured servitude was practiced before this point and after, but that is not, in any way, equivalent to chattel slavery. Indentured servants at this time were usually contracted for a set number of years of service, to pay for their transport to a colony, and this was around seven years in Bermuda's case. The work was backbreaking and harsh, and the system was inherently exploitative. The chattel slave trade was an entirely different beast. I fully intend to go into more detail about slavery in future episodes when it's more established, especially because it's simply unavoidable in any history of the British Empire. But for now, know that even at this early stage, when slavery was yet to be fully instituted, and effectively it was different shades of indentured servitude, there were practical and legal differences in the treatment of indentured servants of different races. It wasn't yet the slavery that would come about in the coming decades, but even at this early stage, their difference in treatment was clear. White indentured servants were contracted for seven years of labour. A long time, but a worthwhile investment for many eager colonists seeking a new life. The terms of service for indentured blacks was, quote, four score and 19 years. 99 years. It was for life. The two pearl divers brought to Bermuda on the orders of Governor Tucker arrived in 1617. They arrived on the ship Edwin, which, quote, brought with her also one Indian and a Negro, the first these islands had ever had, end quote. Simon the Negro, as he was recorded in court records, was soon followed by hundreds more enslaved persons. By the end of the century, almost 40% of Bermuda's population was enslaved, or had previously been enslaved, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. A short journey to the west brings us to the shores of Virginia. Throughout the second decades of the 17th century, the Virginia plantation went from strength to strength. Tobacco was only becoming more and more popular, and settlers continued to arrive. In 1614, the First Anglo-Powhatan War came to an end with the marriage of an English colonist with the daughter of the Powhatan leader. These two are known to history as John Rolfe and Pocahontas. As you might guess from the fact it's called the First Anglo-Powhatan War, this piece would not last. Even if there had not been bad blood between the colony and the tribes, the causes of the First War, namely competition of resources and land, was only getting worse. The colony would keep expanding, 
and in less than a decade, open war would break out once more. In 1619, Virginia's First Assembly met in Jamestown Church, and, as James Horne puts it, formally recognised the Church's spiritual and temporal responsibilities. The Church was brought into line with the laws and practices of the Church of England. In that same year, the first black indentured servants arrived in mainland British America, sold to the colony of Virginia after being captured from a Spanish slave ship by pirates. We will leave Virginia and Bermuda firmly established, with a growing population of both free and unfree people, and we will return in a few narrative years' time. The final colony we'll look at today is also the most northern, Newfoundland. Newfoundland had been the location of previous attempts at colonisation during the reign of Elizabeth, by both the English as well as the French but the first successful settlement took root after the founding of the Newfoundland Company, another merchant company like the Virginia and Summers Isles companies. James granted its royal charter to settle the island, quote, without doing wrong to any other prince or state, end quote. They couldn't do such wrong, even though the French and Spanish governments objected, because the area was so, quote, so vacant that they cannot justly pretend any sovereignty or right thereto. Essentially, if the English got there first, they called dibs. In 1610, the company sent John Guy to settle Avalon Peninsula, the large spit of land sticking out from the southeast coast of the island of Newfoundland. The settlement, Cooper's Cove, began well, but soon the isolated and vulnerable colony came to the attention of English pirates, which I suppose is the downside of cultivating a maritime culture of privateering. The colonists also competed against their countrymen in other ways. The Newfoundland fisheries had been a source of wealth for English fishermen for decades at this point, and had been the reason the English and French had quarrelled over the region. I've come across some contradictory information about who exactly ran the Newfoundland company, with some sources claiming it was the Bristol Society of Merchant Venturers, with others saying that the Newfoundland Company was an explicitly London attempt to break in to the merchant venturer's market. Going by later events, I will agree with Reed and Mank, who state in their chapter within Oxford's Canada and the British Empire that the Newfoundland Company was an attempt by London to get in on the West Country action. The Bristol merchants were up in arms about this interference in what had been a very profitable industry, and objected to both King and Parliament. The dispute would only be settled, finally, and at least on paper, during the reign of Charles, and until then, fishermen based in England and fishermen based in Newfoundland would be at each other's throats. Initial contact with the indigenous inhabitants, the Buthuk, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, was delayed. It is possible that the Privy Council assumed, or believed, that the island was empty of people. They are not mentioned in the Royal Charter, aside from a fairly standard clause that stated that conversion to Christianity was the default priority for any such contact. When contact was finally made, after multiple searches for locals, it was fairly positive. Gifts were exchanged and food was shared. In 1617, the Patuxet to or Squanto, arrived in the colony after having been kidnapped from Plymouth Harbour, modern-day Massachusetts. We'll hear more about Squanto and Massachusetts next episode. Newfoundland would grow even as the first settlement faced difficulties. There were some deaths in the early years, apparently from malnutrition, but there was a child born in March 1613. From 1616, the company dispatched additional settlers to build new settlements, with varying levels of success. So by 1620, English colonies on the other side of the Atlantic were small, but they had staying power. The tobacco colonies of Virginia on the eastern seaboard, and Bermuda in the Atlantic, and the fishing colony of Cooper's Cove, Newfoundland. These colonies, while bringing in some income, had not been the source of vast wealth that many in England had hoped. The Spanish and Portuguese had come back from the New World with holds full of gold and silver bullion. The English had fish and some dried leaves. 
For English investors, the colonies were not bringing in the ludicrous returns they had hoped for and been promised. Now, that would fall to the namesake of this episode, the English East India Company. We last touched on the EIC back in the episode on English exploration and trade. Originally chartered in the final years of Elizabeth's reign, it was granted a monopoly on all English trade with the East. As Philip Lawson puts it in his The East India Company, A History, the terms East, East Indies, Asia, and India were interchangeable in the lexicon of the merchants and officials of Elizabeth and James's England. These lands were so far away, so alien and unknown, that being precise over terms was virtually impossible. Even in official documents, such as the company's charter, the geographic limits of their monopoly were unset and vague. What is clear, in Lawson's view at least, is that early in the company's existence, India wasn't of particular interest. It was the East Indies, the spice islands of modern Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia, that was the main source of profit. India could act as a stepping stone, a place to resupply and support the trading flotillas on their way to and from the spice islands, and maybe they'll buy some goods. But that was it. Aside from the relative lack of knowledge about the East, as well as the dangers and difficulties of voyages to it, the company had a very practical issue of trade. Specifically, what to trade. The English merchants and their customers knew what they wanted from the Indies, mainly spices. The problem was they had very few things to offer. The staple English exports of wool, tin, and lead were bulky, heavy, and not in high demand in the markets of the East. They were expensive to transport and would make little to no profit. The only thing that the English could offer in bulk was silver bullion. Yes, it was just as heavy and difficult to transport as other metals, but its value was much higher in the East than it was in England. The problem was that under English law, exporting silver was illegal. It was the wealth of the kingdom, and for every pound of silver that left English shores in the zero-sum game of early modern economics, the kingdom was a pound of silver worse off. I'm going to quote directly from Lawson here because he spells it out quite nicely. Quote, Consideration of this practicality then opened the door onto other imponderables. Could a dispensation on the bullion restriction be had? If so, would the straight import value of an eastern cargo recoup the initial outlay, or would the English have to become involved in the interport carrying trade of the Indian Ocean? And finally, might it be necessary to develop a re-export trade to Antwerp from England of eastern goods to make the enterprise viable. Any one of these questions left unanswered was capable of bringing the whole eastern design down, and all three were crucial factors in the policy of fits and starts that characterised English contact with the east in the early 17th century." End quote. As we touched on in that, by this stage, ancient episode, by the turn of the century, Portugal's ability to project its influence and military power eastwards was waning. Not gone, mind you, but waning. In 1599, a flotilla of Dutch ships returned from the Spice Islands, having penetrated the Portuguese bubble, and returned with a cargo that caused a crisis in the merchant community of London. Here was evidence that not only was trade possible in the East, but that the profits were substantial. The difficulties would have to be surpassed, of course, but if they were, then the rewards would be great. Elizabeth was convinced, and the royal charter for the East India Company was drawn up. On account of the many difficulties facing the company, the charter differed from many of the other companies we've seen created before and since, and there were a number of special privileges included in its terms. The most important thing, for actually facilitating trade, was that the restriction on export of silver bullion was dropped. The company would now have something that the merchants of the East actually wanted. The company would be organised along fairly democratic lines. The governor, his deputy, and the committee were elected annually by an assembly of shareholders, known as the court, and this court 
could also vote to depose the governor if they wished. The company would be funded through joint stocks, a fairly novel idea at the time. Another condition of the charter that would come to be fragrantly and dramatically ignored was the restriction on the East India Company to only concern itself with trade and profit. Colonisation and conquest of land were strictly against its purposes. Armed ships and sailors were for defence only. So with this charter in hand, the first voyage to the East took place in 1601. Over the next 12 years, there would be 12 similar voyages, and during this time the subscribers struggled to break the habit of centuries by truly investing in joint stock. Investors would commit their capital into a voyage, and only reinvest upon that voyage's safe return to avoid risk. Obviously this limited the company's available capital, when voyages could take more than two years, but gradually the investors caught on and grew more confident in the system. The results of the first decade of the EIC's existence was fabulous. The administrative structure established meant that decisions were made by the executive committee and governor quickly, and based on all available information. There was plenty of interest from London's merchant community, and the first voyage received an investment of £70,000. Investor confidence was buoyed up by the generous advantages granted in the Royal Charter. This voyage exported over £21,000 of silver, and almost £7,000 of other goods like wool, lead, ivory, and iron. The fleet made stops in the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the coast of Western India, and traded their cargo for textiles and other commodities before continuing. When they reached Java and Sumatra, their cargo was traded for pepper, and the fleet returned to London with an enormous profit. This was more or less the system for the next 20 years. Pepper was an ideal trade good. It was light and easy to transport, and was worth its weight in gold, and possibly a bit more. Only a relatively small amount was actually sold in England, and the rest was exported to the continent, particularly to the Baltic. For the first quarter of a century of the EIC's existence, Pepper dominated its trade. So there was enormous profit, but how enormous are we talking? Well, Lawson puts the total investment in the company between 1601 and 1612 at around £517,000. It paid out over £1.2 million. To put it in perspective, a country gentleman would usually expect to receive about fifty to a hundred pounds a year. A household servant, about five pounds a year. Over the next ten years, that profit percentage dropped somewhat, due to rising cost of business that we'll talk about in a second. But the four hundred thousand pounds invested between 1613 and 1623 returned a profit of three hundred and forty-eight thousand pounds. This was a staggering amount of money. By the end of this period, even Prince Charles was getting involved, investing £6,000 into the EIC, and this sign of royal confidence only boosted the company's reputation even further. But I mentioned rising costs of business. Really, this comes down to diplomacy between the English, the local rulers, and the other Europeans. When the company received its charter, the dominant power on the Indian subcontinent was the Mughal or Mughal Empire. By 1600, the Mughal Emperor controlled around three quarters of modern India, including many of the coastal ports that were eagerly sought after by European traders. Getting the Mughal court to support English merchants would make trips to and from the Spice Islands even easier, and therefore more profitable. If they could be permitted to set up factories, warehouses and trade posts run by a factor, it would make the company's business much more efficient. So the EIC sent envoys to the Mughal court at Agra, where they found the Portuguese. The Iberians were well established in the court of the emperor, they had allies and had built up generous goodwill, and they were not about to allow the English to interlope on their action. The Portuguese told Emperor Jahangir that England was an irrelevant minor realm not worth worrying about, 
and that the English traders simply sought to profit from causing chaos. Whether Jahangir was convinced by these arguments, at the very least, he saw no reason to disrupt his relationship with the known quantity that was the Portuguese in favour of these unknown English. After a few years of being stalled and brushed off by the court at Agra, the company sought to use the prestige of the king. James agreed, and sent William Hawking as an embassy to the Mughal Emperor in 1608, and when Hawking's arrived the following year, he proved that James had been right to pick him. He was proficient in Turkey, the language of Jahangir, and had a good understanding of the domestic situation within the empire. Hawking spent two years in Agra, and when he left, he left with an honorary title, a wife, a good reputation at court, but no trade rights. The Portuguese were too entrenched and too useful for the emperor to simply dismiss their opposition to English encroachment. Unless something happened to change that appraisal, the English would continue to play second or third fiddle in the competitive trade scene in the East. Now that, dear listeners, is what we call foreshadowing. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RecordedHistory. Babbel language for life. Three years after Hawking left Agra, in 1613, two company ships under the command of Captain Thomas Best anchored near the coastal town of Surat, the Mughals' most important port. Men were sent ashore to request the right to trade, but while the English ships waited for a response, a larger Portuguese fleet sailed out to see off these intruders. Off the coast of Savali, the two trading fleets battled, with the English coming out victorious and driving off the Portuguese, and the English were able to trade. Two years after this skirmish, an English flotilla under the command of Nicholas Downton defeated another Portuguese force in the same spot. It's important not to overstate the scale of these victories. The first battle was possibly more of a stalemate than an outright victory, but it did have an effect in Agra. Lawson puts it as this, These events had a profound impact on the emperor and his advisers, who were not slow to see the evidence of a change in European power-broking taking place before their eyes. The Mughal Empire had no regular navy of its own, and had always favoured the client sea power of the Portuguese for policing trade in the area. Now, the Emperor's policy appeared to need revision. If English guns were to predominate at sea, the Emperor needed to bring them within his imperial orbit. The East India Company was allowed to establish a factory in Surat, their first permanent presence on the subcontinent, and it would prove to be a fairly permanent presence, about 250 years or so. Anglo-Mughal relations would become more permanent with the arrival of the resident ambassador, Sir Thomas Rowe, to Agra. To the Emperor, the Europeans were convenient for keeping order on the seas, and for opening up another avenue of trade. 
they were not equals. As Lawson puts it, they were foreign minions, or junior partners in this league of friendship. But the court at Agra was quite happy to exploit their new minions. The son of Jahangir and future emperor, Karam, was said to have made a fortune from the European traders, and it was not an equal relationship. Even before he came to the throne, he demanded that his agents get the right of first refusal of any European goods that landed on Mughal shores. Surat, where the EIC had recently founded their factory, was both the most important trading port of the region, if not the empire, and under Karam's control. When they refused to allow his agents this preference, set their prices too high, or refused to sell goods on credit, the prince had no problem sending soldiers to intimidate the traders or surround their factories until they saw the light. He had his own merchant fleet, which he often demanded the Portuguese and later the English protect, as well as attempting to set up his own monopoly over the coral trade. Professor Munis Faruqi of the University of California, Berkeley, recounts how once Karam enlisted the EIC to help salvage a beached ship of his. The company's military victories against the Portuguese were followed in 1622 with the capture of Ormuz, which pitted company ships alongside the forces of the Safavid Shah Abbas against a Portuguese garrison on the island of Hormuz. The Persians took control and granted the company generous trade rights and a permanent share of customs duties from the port of Gombrun. This share was often late coming, or absent entirely, as Persian officials found one reason or another to avoid paying out as the years went on. But this successful action was another chink in the Portuguese trade network in the east. The collaboration with the Safavids in a battle against another European kingdom was ever so slightly against the charter of the EIC, which stipulated that their military pursuits were to be limited to defence. Also, there was the slight obstacle that England wasn't actually at war with Philip III's Iberian Union, of which Portugal was part. The company avoided facing much in the way of repercussions for this by generous, let's call them gifts, to the Lord Admiral, the Duke of Buckingham, as well as the King himself, both receiving £10,000. There were other attempts at expanding the company's remit. In 1617, the company received permission from local rulers to establish a settlement in the Banda Islands. The Banda Islands were the site of repeated tensions between the Dutch and the English. Both were relative newcomers to the area in comparison to the Portuguese, but that didn't mean they would cooperate. The Dutch had their own East India Company, the... Let's just call it the VOC, and the EIC was a rival. The Dutch had established a presence on the islands in the first decades of the 1600s, and there had been violence between the islanders and the Europeans when the Dutch announced their intention to build a fort. The expedition's leaders, and 46 other Dutchmen, were ambushed and killed by the locals. Nevertheless, there were more than 600 Dutchmen remaining, and they successfully constructed Fort Nassau, probably with greater motivation considering what just happened to their admiral. By 1611, the English interlopers had been interfering in Dutch attempts to monopolise the spice trade on the islands by offering higher prices and building forts of their own. Relations worsened over the next four years, until, in 1615, a Dutch force of 900 men assaulted the English positions. The English fell back to Run Island, although whether they did actually run or merely briskly walked is a matter of debate. Thank you very much, I'm here all week. Their counterattack, launched at night, killed over a fifth of the Dutch forces and forced their retreat. In 1616, the Dutch returned with a much larger contingent of soldiers, and while the English resisted for a month, they were eventually overwhelmed, their fort captured, and its defenders killed. The VOC enforced its control over the islands with brutal tactics against the islanders, but the English retained their claim to the island. What was clear by 1623 was that the East India Company had made and lost inroads into the eastern markets through force as well 
as through filling the spaces left by their local and European competitors. After the Battle of Hormuz, the EIC had factories along the Red Sea, the east and west coasts of India, and almost all of the Spice Islands that were open to European trade. They had been established as far as Hirado, Japan, until they left in 1623. Lawson says they were expelled by the Japanese authorities, whereas Professor Akira Hayami instead says they left after failing to secure profitable avenues into the silk trade. Either way, the East India Company would not follow most of its fellow merchant companies in the Jacobean period by being dissolved by the crown due to failure, either strategic or economic. The East India Company would go from strength to strength. Before we finish up today, since this is episode 20, and that's a nice round number, I'd like to thank each and every person who has listened to Pax Britannica so far. It's been four months since the show launched, and honestly, it's flown by. If anyone has any feedback, or just wants to keep up to date with what's going on with the show, you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, or follow me at the Twitter handle, at SamuelHume10. Thank you once again to my House of Lords, the Royal Headsman, executed today, Her Grace, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Most Honourable, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Right Honourable Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, the Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan, the Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, the Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, and the Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo. If you want to join their ranks, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every pledge tier comes with a personalised, ad-free RSS feed, and the higher ranks come with extra perks. Remember as well to give The Age of Victoria a listen. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening.